Oh, okay, right, let's get started. And I will tell you what I know. So you can be as interested in Marie Curie as I am. <clears throat> Flipping you round, are you ready to go? Do, 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 do. Hello, hello, Science Alliance. Hello, I am Lara. I teach free home ed lessons on the internet, science lessons. This is not really one of those. I teach free IGCSE lessons like this. It's not one of those either. This is the one where I tell you all about a thing I learned and then do a Lego story time at the end. So the thing that I've been learning about, the thing that I really quickly researched yesterday because we had a request to do it. It was a brilliant idea. We're gonna learn about Marie Curie because our um, home ed topic at the moment in those lessons has been the periodic table. We've learned about radioactive elements now and Marie Curie like discovered radioactivity and won amazing prizes for it. I am dressed as her, which now I've researched her, I feel like it would not amuse her in the slightest, but it's too late now. So, right, um, who was she? Well, she was born in Poland. Her name when she was born was Mania Slodowska. Oh, great, Mania Slodowska. She was born in 1867 in Poland, but Poland was sort of being controlled by Russia. So being educated was really difficult, especially for women. She did go to a school. Um, it's not funny, it had to keep moving around so that the Russians wouldn't find it, but she did manage to learn some science in uh, this school. Her father was very supportive, he was a teacher, but it was, she loved physics and maths, she just loved science and maths, but women weren't allowed to go to school, to go to university in Poland at the time. Like if, if anyone ever says to you, oh women aren't very good at science, because like, there's no fam female uh, famous scientists it's, really, it's so difficult like it's easy to say the sentence Marie Curie wasn't allowed to go to university in Poland so she moved to Paris where you were allowed to go to university as a woman but imagine how difficult that is she was living in Poland like well her friends were there her family were there her house is there she's luckily her sister had an apartment in Paris so she went to France immediately started studying um had to work very hard her mother had died when she was quite young so the family didn't have very much money but eventually she goes to university in Paris and she gets a degree in um, physics and in maths. She just loves them both so much. Here's a picture of her uh, around this time. Nice photo, isn't it? She's looking a lot younger than she uh, looks in later photos. And famously, while she's in France, uh, she meets a scientist who is working in Paris called Pierre Curie. So this is where she changes her name, right? Uh, she changes her name to Curie because they get married a year after they've known each other. I think they really had a great relationship by the sounds of it. Um, and she changes the, her name to like the French spelling of her name. So she's called Mania, but she starts to call herself Marie. So that's the French version. So she's now Marie Curie. And her and Pierre just have a great time, it sounds like. They have this agreement between them that they're going to live this incredibly simple life. They live in a little apartment, uh, just a stroll away from the experiments. She works in his laboratory for free while she's studying to get a PhD. She will eventually get that PhD. She will be the first woman in the whole of France to get a science P, uh, PhD. Here's some photos of her and Pierre just kind of chilling out and loving their lives together. Look at this. Here they are. So they have a child together. This is Irene, I, that's how you'd say it in English. I'm not sure that's how you say it um, in French, but it's, I think it's lovely. She is working towards her PhD when she has the child. So Pierre's dad looks after little Irene while she does still her PhD. A lot of people that she's working with do not think that that's good. Friends of hers are saying like, he should not be doing all this studying. Stop reading about scientific papers. Go home and look after your daughter. That's what you're like, your body wants to do. But she was just like, no, I'm, I'm good. So I really like this photo. Look, there's Pierre, there's Marie, there's little Irene looking furious about something, but you know, she's a kid. Uh, and, and there's uh, Pierre's dad who looked after uh, I mean, quite a lot of the time. Okay, so it's around this time that Pierre and Marie start, well, I mean, really Marie, to be honest with you, um, starts investigating these mysterious rays. So a French scientist called Henri Becquerel has discovered that certain materials give off rays. We, we now know that it's radiation. Um, we, if you um, have been to the previous lessons, then you know that there's uh, different types of radiation that atoms can give off, okay? Basically, the middle of an atom is made of particles called protons and neutrons, and if there's 
if it's like an unstable amount of them, if there's kind of too many protons or neutrons or it's too big, it's quite complicated, but for some reason, the center of an atom can be unstable. And if it is, you never know when it's gonna happen, but at some point, the center of the atom can spew out some radiation to try and get to be more stable. So here's one of the things that they can spew. It's called an alpha particle. So this is the uh, protons and neutrons in the center of the atom. And to become more stable, some of these nuclei in the center of the atoms release alpha particles, very fast moving particles. It's two protons and two neutrons joined together. There are other types of radiation, which we won't go into too much. Um, here's an alpha particle. You also get uh, beta particles, which are electrons, if you know about those, or gamma rays, um, X rays, like another type of, of ray that comes out of a nucleus. So they know that these exist, but they don't know what they are. Becquerel doesn't know, although he, he has discovered them. And it's Marie Curie who says, I think this might actually be just like something that the atom does. I think this might be behavior of the atom, which sounds obvious to us. At the time, it was a really shocking idea because people thought atoms were just like balls that can't be split and are just very stable. So Marie Curie, Pierre, and Henri Becquerel end up sharing a Nobel Prize, the greatest science prize you can get. Uh, for their work in these these rays, okay, this radiation. Um, the people who give the Nobel Prize aren't that keen to give it to Marie because they don't think she must have done that much work because, you know, she is only a woman. How good could a woman be at science? Pierre has to go to them and say, no, no, it's like it's actually totally her idea. I really just, I just helped because it looked fun. Anyway, she has a Nobel Prize now. That's good. Um, here's some more photos of her and Pierre. I can't, I can't get enough and it gets a bit sad after this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't look happy, do they? But I, th I think they are. They are happy. Mm -hmm. um, Pierre, which is weird because he's, he's working with radioactive substances, which will be proven to be incredibly dangerous later on. Pierre actually dies around this time by um, just being so deep in thought that he steps into a road. He doesn't notice that a carriage is coming. And he gets run over by a horse and carriage. Um, so Marie, for a lot of her life, is left to do all the science work on her own. But she wins another Nobel Prize later for something that Pierre does help her with a bit. Um, she's got this radioactive substance, right? This stuff that is giving off rays. I need, I need the notes for my names. I need my names. Here we are. Right. She's got like a lump of uranium. So she measures how radioactive that is. It's easy to do because luckily Pierre and his brother have literally like invented a machine a few years earlier that you can use to measure the rays. So she measures uranium, she sees how much radiation is coming off. She measures thorium, sees how much radiation is coming off. She's got another lump of stuff, which people think is just uranium and thorium mixed together. But when she measures the rays coming off it, she's like, ah, it's too much. Like the maths doesn't work. There must be something else in there hiding. So her and Pierre in their shed, here is a picture of their shed. Love it, look at that. It's just normal to them. This was just a normal, boring day in their shed, probably, when they put all those bottles there and we had a cup of tea. I love how mysterious this picture seems now. Ugh, history. So in this shed, and indeed outside the shed, there you go, Maria, yeah, I've done all the research for you. Um, they just get sort of barrels of acid and take ages and it's really difficult but they put the substance into acids and hope that the acids will dissolve the thorium and the stuff that they know about and eventually the slushy manky stuff at the bottom of the barrel will be something new the thing that's hiding in this lump of stuff and marie doesn't know what it is and indeed it turns out there are two totally new elements like two new atoms that no one's ever seen before lurking in this material which are also giving off rays so she calls one of them polonium after her homeland of Poland, yeah, polonium. Um, and the other one she calls radium. And she ends up winning a second Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering these two elements, all right? By which point Pierre is uh, sadly deceased. So let's do a little activity because if you ever watch The Symptoms, Simpsons, Homer Simpson <laughs> works at a nuclear power plant with radioactive stuff and he's always like just carrying stuff around that is glowing green and we've all got this really strong idea that radioactive stuff glows. It's actually like kind of, kind of not right. If you've got an adult with you, then, and the adult is a sensible adult, you have, you have my permission to light a candle, okay? If you've brought a candle with you. If you haven't brought a candle, don't worry about it. You just look at mine. Ah, oh, candles, so relaxing. 
and we'll talk a little bit about do radioactive materials glow okay I'm just gonna let that burn for a sec while I show you this big lump of plutonium here we are. Here's a lump of plutonium. We looked at this a little bit in uh, our lesson on the periodic table. It is radioactive. I mean, obviously, look at it. <laughs> of course it's radioactive. It's, it's bright orange. Um, if you held it, don't do that, but if you held it, it would feel quite warm to touch because it's giving off uh, like radio. It's giving off uh, decay. It's decaying, giving off particles, let's say, that have got a lot of energy in them. So it would feel warm, but it's not really actually giving off light exactly. I know, it seems weird. It's not really giving off light, okay? It, this, okay. Let's see if we can get the wick of our candle glowing. Some people were struggling with this on Facebook earlier. Blow out your candle and then gently blow on it and see if you can get it to just glow red. Shall I, um, shall I zoom in for candleless people in the audience? Okay, candle. I'm gonna blow it out <laughs> and then Oh man, now mine's not glowing. Huh. I really thought that people were being awkward on Facebook this morning when they were like, mine's not glowing. Wow, it's not glowing. It's not glowing in the slightest. How sad. <laughs> Let's try it again. Right, the reason we're doing this is because, imagine that the candle is glowing. If you've just got a candle out of a packet, right, and said to me, maybe you need to blow it out straight away. Mm, the matches glow? I don't think so. Let's try it. Holding a match with one hand and a camera phone with the other hand. What could possibly go wrong? Right, we're gonna blow this out, see if it glows. Oh yeah, that is glowing ever so slightly. Not that you can see. Wow, no, massive fail. Okay, I'm not gonna waste any more time on this. It's a fun thing for you to try. <laughs> A fun thing for you to try while I'm talking. Try where I have failed to get a candle glowing. If you got a candle out of a box, right, and I said, oh, do candle wicks glow, what would you say? You wouldn't just say, yeah, would you? If you just get a candle, like if you just buy a candle in a shop and you're holding it, and I say, do candle wicks glow? Well, you're not gonna say, yeah, because it's not, it's not glowing. They don't inherently glow, do they? This plutonium lump is glowing in the same way that a candle wick can glow. It's actually what is happening here, is that the layer of plutonium particles on the outside of plutonium are, are burning. They're just burning at a very low temperature. There's a word for it. I wish I hadn't even told you there's a word for it because now I need to find in my notes that there's a word for it. Pyro, py, pyro something, it doesn't matter. I'll find it at the end. Um, yeah, it's glowing at a very, very low temperature because it's burning in, in the oxygen of the air. But if you took the oxygen away, the lump of plutonium would not be glowing orange. So do radioactive things glow? I don't know, you can decide. Uh, radium, which story time is about, it, it glows slightly blue because it's making the nitrogen in the air around it glow blue. But if you took the nitrogen away, it uh, wouldn't be glowing. So is it glowing? I don't know, you decide. Um, a lot of radioactive stuff glows in water because the radiation that's given off is traveling at ludicrously high speed, like the speed of light. And when it hits the water, it slows down. So it loses energy and it gives off light as it loses energy. So you often see radioactive um, things in water glowing blue. But again, it's really just water that's glowing. Um, if you've got, if you've got, um, if you brought some glow in the dark toys with you, I just made you bring them just to sort of prove to you that they are perfectly safe. Story time is about glowing stuff that caused a lot of horrific damage. Um, but your glow in the dark toys are totally fine. Like they just absorb light and then they give off a different kind of light. Um, <clears throat> But someone did work out, again, this is a bit what story time is about. I don't know what I'm thinking I'll draw on the board. That, what am I going to, I'm going to draw an atom getting excited? No, I'm not going to bother. Uh, someone worked out that certain substances fluoresce. So a fluorescent substance is something that, like, if radiation hits it, then it glows. But it's not the radioactive thing that's going. Okay, I feel like I've said this enough. Let's move on. So Marie Curie, she's won a Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, she's had a child, she's had two children actually, she wins a Nobel Prize in chemistry as well for her discoveries, so she's not the only person ever in the world to win two Nobel Prizes, but she is the only person ever to win two Nobel Prizes in two different subjects as far as I know, like one in physics and one in chemistry. Um, she was at 
very famously the first ever Solvay conference. These still go on, really big meetings of very important scientists who discuss their work. Um, here is a picture of her at a Solvay conference and actually two things about this photo I'm going to show you and see if you can work out. One person in this photo wasn't there at the time and when they released it to the newspapers they had to photoshop him into the picture like get another photo of him and cut it out and stick it in because it's 1911 so that's how they had to do it see if you can spot the person who's been sort of photoshopped in and see if you can spot another incredibly famous scientist and see if you can spot Marie Curie it's like where's Wally three things to find okay Marie Curie the person who's been photoshopped in and another extremely famous scientist at the very first Solvay conference so she's here at the same year she won the Nobel uh, Prize the second one for discovering polonium and radium. So I th I'm reckoning she's quite easy to find because she's the only woman there. <laughs> you do not spot the person who's photoshopped in. Some people on Facebook did spot the very famous scientist. You got him? So obviously there's Marie Curie. Love that picture. I mean, obviously they're they're all posing. It looks like she's working really hard on something, but I'm guessing that these people at the front, including her, must have just decided it would be funny if they looked like they were studying. <laughs> I don't know. All were bored of the whole thing. So that's Marie Curie, obviously, at the table. Um, this is Mr Solvay. He has been cut out and stuck in later. He wasn't actually there at the time, or he wasn't at this meeting. And this guy is Albert Einstein, looking very young. But it's the the uh, fifth Solvay conference, which is actually the most famous one. Um, so Einstein and Marie Curie, I don't know if they were like best buds, but they certainly knew each other. She got quite ill. I mean, radiation is extremely dangerous. I should probably explain just before we do story time, um, like why she sort of didn't immediately die, to be honest. So there's three different types of uh, radiation, right? There's alpha particles, there's um, electrons, and there's gamma rays, basically like light, but have got loads of energy. Alpha particles can be stopped by a human hand, right? Or like a small uh, a piece of paper. So they, they just kind of bounce off. So radium that Marie Curie discovered, it gives off, it actually gives off all of these, but it gives off alpha particles. Um, anything that gives off alpha particles, I mean, if you held it, the radiation would be stopped by a hand. It wouldn't go into your body, so you could hold it. Like Queen Elizabeth II, uh, bless her, held a piece of something very radioactive and was like, oh, one feels that it is warm. But it was giving off alpha particles that didn't, didn't necessarily damage you, although it's not a great idea. Um, electrons can go through paper and your hand, um, like beta radiation, we would call this. Um, but they are stopped by very thin pieces of metal, like a sheet of aluminium will stop that electron. Whereas gamma rays uh, will go through sheets of thin metal and you've got to use lead to stop them. <laughs> Writing backwards, I'm used to Facebook. Wow, Facebook has broken my brain. Yeah, that says lead. Uh, so this is why if you go to, for an x-ray, um, x-ray is quite similar to gamma rays, it's got less energy but it would still be very damaging. X-rays can travel through your hand, that's good, you can get an x-ray, um, but you wouldn't want x-rays to constantly travel through your body, which is why the person x-raying you will be wearing a lead apron to block the x-rays because they don't want to get exposed over and over again. So Marie Curie obviously exposed quite a lot because they didn't know that the radiation was dangerous at the time. Uh, so she did She did get ill. She had a problem with her kidneys and it took her a couple of years to recover. And Einstein came to visit her. And this is the photo of Marie Curie and Einstein. What are they talking about, eh? We'll never know. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and here she is with her daughter. If you're wondering how Irene got on, well, they kind of had a hideous relationship because Irene ended up winning a Nobel Prize too. It's nice, isn't it? And her other daughter ended up writing her biography. Just a close-up because I just like that photo. Again, I'm assuming it's all posed, but... Great hair, the Curies. <laughs> here she is getting a little bit older. This is 1925. And here's the really famous Fifth Solvay Conference. You can spot Einstein straight away, yeah? You see Curie and Einstein? Um, Einstein has come to the front. It's obviously more important than he was before. But this photo is, is such a famous photo. Like nearly every, if you do even A-level physics, you'll have heard of nearly every scientist in this photo by the end of the course. Look at them, delighted. Um, yeah, so just to finish off, she, she had a bit of a scandal. So Pierre had died, but she, we think, started having a relationship 
with another scientist who did have a wife and his wife got really cross and told the tabloid newspapers and it was a bit of a sort of shocking scandal. Um, there's a lovely quote from her where she basically just says, I, oh, she does say, I believe there is no connection between my scientific work and the facts of the private life. There you go. So we probably shouldn't talk about it either. Uh, so yeah, she died in um, 1935, I think. Eve was her second daughter, and uh, um, yeah, I think that's it. I think we should just go to story time. Boop, boop, boop. She died in 1934, beg your pardon. Um, and because she worked so closely with radium, and it's so dangerous, and it lasts for such a long time, we still can't display her, her books, her notes that she wrote in her laboratory in museums. They've got to be kept in a lead box. I know. Right. I think I've told you all I need to tell you to do this story time. It's a difficult story time to write this one, but I had a request that could we please um, could we please learn about this in story time? So here we go. I'm going to sock it to you. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Sorry about the noise. I don't know if it's picking it up on the microphone. My neighbour is a great fan of cutting wood with uh, chainsaws. <laughs> That's what he's doing right now. Don't worry. I'm not in any danger. <clears throat> it's 1902 and inventor William J. Hammer is excited. He's worked with Thomas Edison and helped him invent the light bulb. That was exciting. He's invented the electric advertising sign. That was exciting. And now he's in Paris working with scientific royalty Pierre and Marie Curie. Woohoo! So they've told him all about radium, this amazing substance they've discovered that gets warm when you touch it. Uh, so when he goes back to America, he, he takes some with him. They give him some radium. Um, and the First World War breaks out. And soldiers in the First World War are having a terrible time because it's really important that they know what time it is, right? But if they turn a light on to try and check their watch, that tells the enemy where they are, which leads to very bad consequences. So this is a terrible problem. You, you can't just light candles to check your watch in the middle of the night when you're in the trenches. What do you do? Well, inventor William J. Hammer uh, comes up with a solution to that too. Mixing radium with glue and zilk, zinc sulfide makes a paint that glows. So he says, well, we'll paint that paint onto watches and then soldiers will be able to see what time it is without being discovered. Uh, the company that has the job of painting the watches is called the US Radium Corporation. They call the glow-in-the-dark paint undark and sell it to people for all kinds of things. Here's a real, oh, that's not it. Here's a real advert from the time. Advertising, undark, it shines in the dark. And uh, they advertise it because they're painting onto watches, but they also advertise it for all kinds of things. Like you could put it onto the number of your house so that people can see it, onto furniture legs so you don't bang into your furniture in the dark, put it on your light switches. Uh, they recommend painting it onto doll's eyes so that the doll's eyes glow in the dark. Why would you want to, I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> they do. Um, the people doing this painting of the watches, for the US Radium Corporation are hundreds and hundreds of women who uh, haven't gone off to fight in the war and, and are getting quite good money to, to paint the watches. Now, the radium painted onto watches by the hundreds of women, obviously, if you've ever done any painting, you know that brushes have got to be quite sharp in order to, to do painting properly. Um, and painting tiny little numbers onto a dial with radium paint is very difficult. How are you gonna get your paint so, paintbrush so pointy? Well, first of all, the Radium Corporation uh, give water and cloths so that the women can use those. Uh, but eventually they think, oh, it's actually a bit of a, a waste of materials. And they end up saying to the women, look, can you just please, um, can you just put like the paintbrush into your mouth? Okay, just put the paintbrush in your mouth get it nice and pointy, and then uh, that'll, you do a great job. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so that's what they do. These women are putting uh, radioactive radium paint into their mouths frequently, multiple times a day, 
to paint the watches. Uh, they're not actually that worried about this because at the time, uh, people knew that radium was being used to help treat diseases. And this is absolutely true. Yet another idea by William J. Hammer, radium replaces calcium in people's bodies. So if you put a small amount of radium into people's bones that are diseased, the radiation radium gives off will kill the diseased cells. This is, this is absolutely true. Uh, it's a treatment still used today. This is the Cancer Research UK website that you can see right now. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, radium is used in hospitals to treat diseases. Um, so some of the women were even painting the paint onto their fingernails or onto their uh, teeth, you know, just for a laugh. The first group of people to notice a problem were the dentists. One of the women, uh, these women who were painting the watches, would come to be known as the Radium Girls. She started having problems with her teeth. They started falling out. More and more of the factory workers started to have dental problems and became extremely ill. And no one seemed to know why, but after three years, a doctor suggested that maybe the problem was something to do with radium. But then specialists from Columbia University, a specialist named uh, Frederick Flynn asked to check the woman and he says, oh yeah, actually she's absolutely fine. And his colleague that he'd brought with him, he agreed, yep, the woman was fine. Um, she wasn't fine. The radium in the paint was replacing the calcium in her teeth and bones and making her extremely poorly indeed. What nobody knew was that uh, these specialists from Columbia University were not doctors. They were working for the US Radium Corporation and wanted to cover up a scandal. Uh, eventually, too many people asked too many questions and US Radium Corp had to get in a specialist who was not connected to them at all. So this, this new scientist who's nothing to do with US Radium Corp came in and ended up giving a report saying, uh, yep, this is definitely absolutely terrible. These women are working in appalling conditions and, you know, something really has to be done. Lots and lots of changes need to be made. Uh, what do you think US Radium Corporation did about that? Well, what they did was they took the report and they, uh, they just rewrote it, saying, no, nope, everything is totally fine. And uh, women continued working at the factory. Eventually... Another scientist, the first scientist's friend, found out about this faked report uh, and told everyone and the proper report was published. Um, and the Radium Corporation went to court, but they were incredibly rich and powerful and uh, the women were poor. And at this point, they were they were all extremely poorly. So sadly, um, they were sort of forced to do what's called settling outside court, which means the women got given a bit of money, which they weren't really in a position to use, to be honest. Yeah, there, you can have one. Um, and the US Radiation Corp got away, all the people who'd worked at the US Radium Corp got away scot-free, really, without prison. Um, the newspapers, though, and the people of the country were absolutely disgusted. And because of the outcry and the bravery of the radium girls, as they were called, laws were changed, which made it a lot easier for workers to take their bosses to court and which made factories a lot safer. It didn't help the women who painted the radium onto the watches, but it helped a lot of others and still does today. The end. I think story time is quite fun. That was probably the most horrendous topic we've ever covered in uh, LEGO Story Time. Thank you for sharing it with me. It was very interesting, wasn't it? And probably uh, good to know these things. Look, here's a picture of the actual uh, women, if you want to know, the Radium Girls. I think these days we'd probably call them women. 1922, not even that long ago, really. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this, is, this was something interesting, which I didn't know, that... So the, how they made the paint was it was a radioactive material mixed with something that glows green when, uh, it, when it's sort of exposed to uh, radioactivity. So really old watches, like from the First World War, the, the stuff that glows green kind of worn off so it won't be glowing green. But actually the radium will still be there and still is radioactive. So this isn't really, it's like not too much of a problem. I don't know, you check for yourselves. Um, 
it's not too much of a problem if the watch is still in really good condition, but obviously a lot of watches from, like watches from the First World War are 100 years old. So if they get cracked or damaged, it's actually really dangerous. A university went and did a, a study in a room where someone was, quite a small room where someone was collecting them and had 30 watches and found that the levels of radiation in the room were incredibly dangerous. So just something to note, you know, if you're ever at a museum, you walk past a watch from, from World War One. Have a think about it. Be careful. Uh, okay, you lot. That is the end of the uh, Marie Curie show. Thank you so much for joining me. I've got a few like extra little things to tell you from my notes, actually, but I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up there for the people who are watching live. You might want to go. Um, if you are enjoying these lessons, you can support me. A, a quick note that this is the last show before a week off for half term because I would have children in the room. That just wouldn't work. So I'm taking a week's holiday and then... Uh, we start again on the 21st of February with like the less all the lessons and the show as normal. Okay, yeah, if you want to support me, you can go to my about section on uh, YouTube and click the link to coffee that takes this website where you can support me with five pounds a month. And for five pounds a month, I will send you Theo Science magazine. I'm so proud of it. It's so good. This is a, a past one that I will send you if you sign up now. It's got a beautiful comic in it about the artist Monet that my husband illustrated for me. Um, it's got ideas, it's got an article that took me ages to read about how colour works and about how the primary colours of paint are definitely not what you think they are. Uh, it's got some optical illusions. Yeah, I'm very proud of Theatre Science Magazine. So if you sign up today, I'll send you that. And I will also send you some rainbow glasses and an explanation of how they work. They're so good. I'm not even going to show you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to let you have to order them from me if you want them. But don't nag, you know? Times are hard. Don't be nagging people. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go to my Facebook page um, because I did put a little post up there saying if you are watching live and you would like to say hello, then you can. But yeah, I'm going to check my notes because there's definitely something else that I wanted to... Oh, yeah, just a little bit about, like, how Marie Curie's been remembered. Yeah, so um, she was a really private person. She just wanted to do science. But obviously, she's got two Nobel Prizes. She's a woman. This is incredible at the time. Um, she went over to America and got this really big, like embarrassingly big, amazing reception. Um, this journalist there had sort of arranged for her to do lots of talks and uh, she ended up kind of cancelling a lot of them or at least saying, like, can I just not talk at them? I'm super tired. There's a lot of reports of her kind of not bothering to shake people's hands. Um, what it was was she... she she wanted some money. She didn't have enough money to buy new uh, radioactive samples. And this journalist said that she'd help. Um, but how the journalist helped was she wrote loads of stories about how Marie Curie like really wanted to cure cancer and save millions of people's lives. And she sort of built her up to be this like Florence Nightingale kind of really generous, warm hearted character, which did work. Like loads of Americans were really inspired to give her lots of money. But but sort of of, I mean, I'm sure she was a perfectly nice person. It's not why she was doing it. Like, as we sort of saw, radioactive substances have been used to treat cancer. That's not why she was doing it. She just thought it was great. So, yeah, that's why throughout history, our idea of who Marie Curie was has kind of changed a bit. Hopefully our idea is more realistic now. Hello, Grace and Rose. When you try doing the candle thing, maybe if you let it burn and blow it out gently. Isla, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, where's my matches? Did I throw them angrily across the room? Oh no, they're here. <laughs> oh, Soph, yours glowed, you lot. Ah, oh, nice. Ah, and Jack and Mary's. Oh, Mary and I are here. Two other fabulous half Polish women. Oh, <gasps> no. Can you speak Polish, you guys? Oh, and Grace is here as well. And Rose. Hello, Rose. And Grace. Right, Isla, let's do your. Th oh, oh, it's Bella. My mum was supposed to tell me when this went live and she got distracted by work. What? Priorities, Bella. Sort your mum out. Uh, okay, let's do Isla's suggestion. What do I do? Blow it out gently. It sort of glows when I first light it, she says, holding a very waxy candle above her Apple computer. Maybe if you let it burn and blow it out gently. All right. Ah, oh, Soph and Co. Jack and May, I'm so jealous. Right, here we go. Try it. If you've got any questions, by the way, let me know <laughs> while I blow this out. Oh yeah, that does get a bit of glow. The tiniest bit. It's, what's the science behind that? Why did it glow before? Yeah. 
and then nothing. Why would a candle glow the first time you blow it out and not the second few times? Huh. Well, thanks, Isla. I tried. All right, you lot. Um, have a lovely week's holiday. I don't really matter, does it? But I'm, I'm sure you'll have a nice week doing fun things, as you always do. And I will uh, see you the week after next for a whole new Lego Storytime show. Have you got any suggestions? Let me know. I've got a lot here. We had a good meeting earlier today. I've got owls on the list, jellyfish, tortoises, peekers, I don't know where they are, birds, mouse, deer, green screens, horses, um, otters. That's a good one. A lot of votes for Einstein. You all want to know about Einstein. Totally fair cars yeah and aeroplanes so if you've got any more suggestions do let me know i would be delighted to hear them because uh, your ideas are always better than mine it makes my life a lot easier if i can just do what i'm told <laughs> it's basically my business model okay you lot right i'm gonna go thanks so much for coming bye